as you're turning, let me let me say that at the end of this session, we'll just take a few minutes out to be with the Lord. Um, the Lord has ministered to our needs, Amen. And He's done. He's He's blessed us and touched us and all this Romans six, um, but. But I feel at the end of uh, this session, <clears throat> either right where you're sitting or if you want to just uh, make an altar there with your chair at the end of it, that we would, uh, you, know, you know, a lot of times we're looking for the Lord to do something, so we'll do something. Well, he's done some things, and, and I think at the end, maybe we could just those that it's in their heart to do, to just, uh, in one sense, go to another level with the Lord. Find some area that, you, that you've held back on the Lord from or something that you could turn over to his nail-scarred hands and... Uh, and make a step, make some progress. You know, we can, you can come to a conference like this and feel good about everything, but not really make any commitments in your heart. Do you know what I mean? And, and you know, I'm not saying change the world. I'm just saying make a step, <laughs> you know. And I even thought this. I thought, you know, there's some people that have motions sometimes in them of beasts, like what we've been talking about inside the ark. That maybe you need to open yourself to the Lord for him to deal with you and deal with some of those beasts, whether it's you want to call it deliverance or just prayer or something, but to consider that there are things that that really ought to be acted upon to uh, remove. And... Um, Again, Mike Gentry is here, and we don't have to do that today, but for s particularly uh, afterwards or later or, or for some of you that are around to contact him to tell him you'd like some prayer over some motions that aren't the Lord. How about that? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm just, I know I'm sort of being vague, but I think the ones who know what I'm talking about will will hopefully respond. Um, Romans 6, we were talking about, uh, you know, the basic picture in the basic conference that I've, my part has been um, <clears throat> about Noah. And brothers and sisters, how about Mallory and Ben and their sharing? Hadn't it just been <laughs> wonderful? <laughs> Praise God. just from the Lord and so precious and, and uh, <clears throat> just, I'm just super blessed. And I'm also glad that Ben cleared up that whole thing with the brain deal. <clears throat> uh, let it be on record that I am incredibly for the Lord in women of intellect and that they might progress and be given freedom in the ministry. Most of our people here are going, we know that, but people watching this or listening might think, oh, he's a Texan. <laughs> Keeps them women down or something. <clears throat> so I, uh, I just want to assure you that, that anything that was said that could have sounded like that is not the case, and that Ben did an excellent job of showing that really I was trying to talk about the Lord, and, and as he pointed out, I'm not, you know, not very good sometimes with my examples and things. I tell you what, when it comes to the men and women who preach Christ that I know of, they are head and shoulders above me in their eloquence and their ability to say it and to get it out there. Uh, I, I'm just privileged that I can kind of get a chance every once in a while. But I do make mistakes and I do fumble and... Uh, I'm not always clear, so please pray for me and keep loving me because uh, I just need Jesus and I need the Holy Spirit. And you would never, 
know that I have really, really, really prayed that the impartation might come across. But uh, anyway, just keep me in your prayers anytime you hear that I might be sharing somewhere. Romans 6 and verse 4 says this. Therefore we are buried. Well, right there, just stop right there. Therefore we are buried. Now we've been talking about this ark and we talked about the flood representing the death of the old man and the old creation and the removal of all of that and the scriptures declare that to be true. In fact, Romans 6 is full of that. And then <clears throat> that the ark, though, represents burial, that there's death, and I would, yeah, the flood is death, the ark is burial, and the new creation that, that he enters into after he leaves the ark <clears throat> is resurrection. And that there is this step, this stage that many Christians, many, and I use this term, but deeper life, I don't really particularly like that term, but, but most people know what I'm talking about when I say it. So uh, they skip this step and therefore they immediately seem to jump from death to resurrection without any reality of burial and the need, the need for burial and the incredible need that we have to know what that's all about before we start talking and acting like new creatures. In other words, before we start acting like we've gained something that, you know, we haven't, uh, not in experience anyway. And so uh, there is this, and, and you can, you know, you can see that with uh, Israel. When they were in the wilderness, or when they were in Egypt, <clears throat> here they go. They put the blood on the door and thank God they go into their house and then the death angel passes over and praise God, you know, their firstborn didn't die and, you know, that. But folks, even though that's true, they have not reached the promised land yet. And in fact, they're a long way from it, but they're still God's people and God's still moving and there's still this, this progression. For, I put down here Egypt, the wilderness, the ark representing the wilderness and the promised land representing the new creation <clears throat> that Noah entered into. And, uh, but, but there were realities that they needed to face. And one of those was, while they're in Egypt, while, while they're there, they are suffering under Pharaoh, and they're suffering under these taskmasters, and they're, they're, they're being beat, and they're being driven, and they're in the house of bondage, and, and all of this stuff is happening to them. And so they're, they're praying, aren't they? Aren't they? They're praying, and they're praying, oh, God, you know, get me out of here and get me out of this death and get me out of this house of bondage and, oh, get me away from these bad people. Amen? Okay, so God says, okay, and he brings them across the Red Sea, and there at the Red Sea they see all the bad people dead, the flood, if you will. Amen? But then they enter into the wilderness and now the issue is no longer the bad people, but they're starting to be identified as the bad people. They're the ones that are uh, messing up. They're the ones that are, you know, doing all these things and, and causing God's wrath and all this kind of stuff. And so they all of a sudden they're being awakened to this reality that, you know what, Pharaoh isn't the only Adam. We're Adam too. Amen. And we need Jesus just as much as they do. And, and let me tell you, that reality has to be punched home by the Holy Spirit. You can't just go through a few little things and go, okay, I get it, yeah, yeah, I'm bad, thank you, Jesus. No, no, you must be convinced. Because the more you're convinced, the greater Jesus will become to you. That's the whole key, and that's, that's this whole thing. And so, uh, th in fact, there's, a, there's a, a scripture that I sort of like along that vein. It's over in 2 Peter. We've gone to First and Second Peter a lot, haven't we? 2 Peter uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> yeah, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 6, and we'll read down through 8. Second Peter 2, 6, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those 
that after should live ungodly and delivered just Lot vexed with the filthy manner of life of the wicked. Now notice, has anybody know anything about Lot? Has anybody, I mean, if you know about Lot, have you ever read this and gone, you know, he was vexed with the filth. You know, what is the deal with that? That dude was bad. He was the progenitor of Moab, the nation that attacked God's people for, you know. Uh, and not only that, but they, Moab is the result of Lot having sexual relationship with his daughter. You know, and you're going, that, you know, he's vexed with the, what, you know, you understand what I mean? I mean, you, you're kind of going... Wait a minute, dude. But I'm thinking that, that his soul is grieved over this situation with them. Of, he's, he's grieved over the ugliness of them. He has not yet seen his own ugliness. And it is possible for us to be grieved over other people's ugliness. Can I get a hearty amen? amen. It is possible. And to be fed up like Israel or like Lot, you know. Lot was fed up with Sodom and Gomorrah in the sense of that that it was, apparently it really did grieve him and stuff. It means you can be Lot, not Abraham. You can be Lot and grieved over somebody else. Yeah, You don't have to be David to be grieved over someone else. You can be pretty bad yourself and go, you're, you're a bad person, you know. You are too, you know. And yeah, but I'm not bad in the way they are. No, but like you're grieved with them, somebody's grieved with you over something about you. No, no, not me. God's going to have to shut you up in the ark. You get it? He's going to have to shut you up in the ark. <laughs> and the only way you're going to, excuse my text, and the only way you're going to shut up is to be shut up. Yeah, <laughs> it's the only way it's going to happen. You, trust me, you will wiggle and wrangle and work. And, you know, I've often said if, if Adam digs a hole in the ground and gets thrown or is thrown in a hole in the ground, he'll start making it comfortable and he'll carve out a little pillow wall, pillow thing so I can lay back like this, you know, and little shelves and stuff. And pretty soon, you know, I mean, uh, he thinks a lot of himself. And we need to be convinced of the incredible foulness of ourselves before we're going to really, really, really appreciate Jesus. Oh, we might be convinced of how bad we did as sinners and therefore accept Jesus as our Savior, but that doesn't make Jesus our life. We've got to give up on our life and want to because he's not going to just rip off that. He, he's, you need to see it and go, you know what, I am... You know, I'm just as bad as Pharaoh and all that. You know? And I need the Lord. And that's what this whole wilderness began to, to be for them. And that's what uh, being inside the ark was for, for um, Noah. And nowhere in the Bible does it say, and all the animals came in the ark and they all got along the whole time and God gave them a supernatural ability for everything to just get along. Does it? It doesn't say that anywhere. In fact, it's incredibly silent on what happened in there. <laughs> you know? You know why? Because before the ark, when God comes to Noah, now he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord comes to Noah and says, hey, I want you to build an ark, and you're going to gather two of every animal, and we're going to float away, and we're going to go to a new creation. And it's all romantic to him, isn't it? Oh, man, oh goody goody gumdrops you know yes and and it's just this beautiful picture and it's oh everything's gonna be wonderful now we're gonna get away from those bad people you know you you know the, you know the bad people the ones who mocked us while we're building what god told us to build you you know those people 
the ones who treated us mean and laughed at us. Thank God they're going to be wiped out. And I'm going to be saved. And I'm going to be God's special man or woman. And we're going to just be so happy together. Yeah. Yeah. And so God does supernaturally bring, them, bring the animals together. So here they come. Oh, look. look. Ding, ding, ding. Can you know, anybody see uh, Evan Almighty? Yeah. So, you know, the animals, you know, all the animals just coming on in and they're all happy and everything's wonderful, you know. The Bible is incredibly silent about this cocoon. He doesn't let you know, but I'm telling you that the pattern and the principle is the same in the wilderness or here or in any other example that God gives you. He doesn't break pattern. The principle and the way that God works is the same. So I know, I mean, I don't have to see it there. I know what took place in there. This is burial. This is the wilderness. This is not God dealing with them over there in the flood anymore. This is God dealing with us. Judgment was there. Now judgment's in the house of God. He wants to what? He can't even conform us to the image of Christ in here until we've realized how much we need this new creation reality. You know? For example, the name of this church is New Creation Fellowship. So therefore, everything is perfect here. Because <laughs> we chose that name. So we know that everything is, nothing's, you know, we didn't call it the Ark Fellowship. <laughs> we live it, but we didn't call it that. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's show something there uh, in Genesis 7 where it's talking about Noah. Turn with me, if you would. Genesis 7. And uh, verse 17. <clears throat> Genesis 7, 17 says, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the water increased and bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth. Okay, so here um, the earth is being destroyed by the flood. The ark is being lifted up. But there's this, there's this trial going on inside of the ark where all these beasts, you know, we, we had an example from Ben sharing about pigs. I've talked about monkeys, but there's all sorts of creeping things, fowls of the air, all of these things, all of them with a different nature and a different way to mess with you. You know, these are our beasts, not theirs anymore. Before, when it was in the world, and we'd look at the, you know. You know I remember in, uh, my wife and I were missionaries in Jamaica for, for several years. And when we first got there, uh, people would tie a, a leash around their pigs and walk around with them and stuff. And we're going, that's weird, you know. And uh, when she got pregnant, we went to the clinic there. We were not in a big city. We were in a small thing. Went in the clinic there, and we're sitting there on this little bench, you know, a little handmade bench, you know, waiting for our turn. And the door's wide open, and in walks a pig. <laughs> we're sitting there going, my God, you know, and we're looking around, and nobody else is going, my God. They're just going, hey, hey there's George, <laughs> you know, or whatever, you know. And then a goat comes in walking around. We're just going... This is insane! <laughs> they didn't think anything of it. <clears throat> you get used to those things. But, but when it's not your pig, you go, oh my God! And you start pointing over there to those people before the flood hits. Oh, look at, look at them! You know? So what does God have to do? He has to put you in an ark with your beast. These are your beasts. 
They're not theirs. They don't exist anymore, nor do their beasts. The only one left is you and your beasts. And you go, I don't want to look at this. I don't want to see this. What happened to that romantic, beautiful place I thought I was going? You're still heading there, but it's never going to be romantic in the way that we dream it up. It's going to be greater than romantic. It's going to be Christ. Not I, but Christ. That's, that's who it's going to be. And so, you know, and we realize that because we pass through the waters. The scriptures tell us that, don't they? All, uh, not just in Noah, but they tell us that we pass through the waters, you know. And, and boy, that's, you know, that's exciting for us because those waters are bringing judgment on the mockers. And not just the mockers, the mockers who mocked us. Because that's where we really want the judgment to come. But folks, we need to be judged also. But God isn't going to judge us with the flood. He's going to judge us in another way. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this. He judges them with the waters, and we pass through those. But he deals with us with the fire. Hmm? He deals with us with the fire. You know, you look at Jonah. Jonah's in the boat. Jonah's in the boat. He's going along, you know, and everything. And he's making it, and the storm comes. And he's going to pass through the waters. It's those people that are outside, you know, that are in the boat, but they're, they're outside and they're freaking out. And they go, oh, man, there's a storm. You know, we're not going to pass through the water. Jonah's not worried about it. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat. Anybody remember that? They had to go down there and wake him up and say, dude, you need to pray. We're going down. <laughs> Get up. He didn't have any fear because he knew that this judgment was not his judgment. Can I get a man? That's all settled. But God's got a place for him, and it's in the belly, not of the boat, but of the whale. And that's where he's going to face the fiery trial. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, but we... That's the first thing we think. This is strange. <laughs> you know, usually, you know, this is strange. I don't deserve this. I'm one of the good people. I'm in the ark. <laughs> you know, you know, this, Lord, send this on. No, the fire is reserved for you. It's going to burn up the elements of the earth that's still in you. That's, that's what the Lord has in mind. And so... You know, inside the belly of the whale, that's where Jonas personally got to meet with God. Personally got to find out not just what's wrong with Nineveh. Amen? Isn't it funny that, that you know, I mean, I always think of those examples like, you know, Nineveh, they're the really bad people in, in a real way they were, and yet God's doing all this stuff to Jonah. You know, and let me tell you, just to die a swift death asleep in your hut by a flood is nice. But being in an ark with beasts for over a year is tough. Lord, this is worse than them. And I always think of, I always think of that when Jesus was in, when uh, he was in the garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, he's praying and everything. And then this crowd comes and everything. And, you know, here they are. We're going to take Jesus. We're going to kill Jesus. We're going to falsely accuse Jesus. We're going to do all this bad stuff against Jesus. And so Peter pulls out a sword. Whack, cuts this guy's ear off. What does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't go, you stupid malchus. No wonder you lost your ear. You're You're irritating. Sorry, but you know, <laughs> but not anymore. <laughs> you know, and uh, but instead, he doesn't rebuke the bad people. He turns to Peter and said, "What are you doing?" You, I mean, think about it. Because in this judgment over here of the flood, man, he just takes them out. That's it. It's over with. The cross. You're dead. You're no longer. But with God's people. I want to show you why they died. See these beasts that they had? You got them too, and we've got to deal with this. In other words, we've got to know the cross more than just, what was the terms we used? Doctrine, theology, truths and facts, and deeper life, and 
You know, great, great and wonderful things. I would, I would that everyone knew that. Every Christian knew this stuff, but yet keep on going and, and until we're in the arms of Jesus, if you understand what I mean. I, and I don't mean that romantically as much as I mean it by a face-to-face -face relationship. branch drawing out the life of the vine. I'll tell you, you do not appreciate nor endeavor to draw out the life of the vine. You, you seek the help of the Lord, but you don't endeavor to draw out the life of the vine until you see how dried up you are. And then you, you realize, you know, I need life. <clears throat> I remember uh, the story of uh, Charles Finney when he would preach. Anybody familiar with, with Charles Finney, great revivalist and everything? And they said that, that when he would preach, he would start, you know, talking to people about your life and how you're not going after God and all this stuff. And he said, if there was a big hole right here and it was straight into hell and the flames were lapping up and reaching out to grab you and everything and grab your leg and start to pull you in and everything, you'd be screaming, ah, you know, hell's flames are all around me it's trying to pull me in, you know, i got to get to Jesus. And after he'd preach, everybody would run to the altar. Yeah, they go, oh, my God, I need Jesus. And he said, as long as you don't understand that that's the, where you're going and that's what's going on, you just live life happily and everything. Well, as long as you don't understand that you have no life that's worth anything unless it's Christ, you, if you don't understand that, you will do the best you can. What, did, what does it say of David? David said, man at his best is altogether vanity. Yeah. It's your righteousness that's as filthy rags, not your badness. Your badness is worse than that. Your righteousness is, you know, menstrual cloths. That's the actual translation of that. All of your goodness is like that. Everything you would try to give and do But if he sees it that way, and so we go about our business, you know, oh, oh, we toss the Lord up a few menstrual rags. I'm sorry, but that is the actual translation. And it is, it is a more clear picture of how we treat Jesus and bring it up there and act like we're really giving him some here. Oh, let me lay this in your lap. Come on, it's the same thing as the, the fire, but it's a more clear picture of Christianity and what we're trying to do. You know, oh, we, I just, you know, I thought you'd like this. And if we saw it for what it was, we would go, oh my God, I need life. I need Jesus. You'd pursue him. You'd get in the word. You'd cry out. You'd, you, you would go, uh, you would find people. And that's why I appreciate this conference and people that, that do come. You would find a place where somebody would lift him up and point you there. And you'd go, yes, I want the Lord more than anything else. And you'd mean it. You know what I'm saying. You'd mean it. I know that it was hard for some of you to come here and be here over Thanksgiving and to not be with family or friends or stuff. I, I believe with all my heart that there's something powerfully at work in your heart to get to Jesus, and I'm, I'm going to say it like this. I'm, you know, for whatever it's worth, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. And I mean that. Because there's so many that just nonchalant, that, you know, they are at ease in Zion. Everything's, you know, oh, it's all okay. It's not okay. My God, the whole, everything's shaking. <laughs> you know, it's all Tenuous and barely, you know, holding together. But we can't just run from fear of what's happening to the earth. We have to run for love to the Lord and say, you are worth it. You know, I was thinking about it with a, 
with a, you know, a twenty-dollar bill. If I if I pulled out a twenty-dollar bill and said, you know, anybody, you know, anybody want this twenty-dollar bill, you know, I I would do that, but I don't have a twenty. <laughs> you know, I I would use a real example, but I don't have one. <clears throat> but you, you know, anybody want? Oh yeah, yeah, I want that twenty-dollar bill. I take that thing up. I go just like that, you know. Smush it all up. You still want it? Yeah, that don't make any difference. You remember they came to Jesus and they said, you know, da 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 da. And Jesus said, look, you know, give me a coin. Whose inscription is on that? Whose image is on that? What's Caesar? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and render to the Lord the things that are Lord. We're supposed to be in the image of Christ. Am I right or wrong? But you take that $20 bill and you crumple, crumple it up and you say, okay, you know, you still want this? Well, you know, some, you know, some would might say, oh, it's all crumpled up, I don't, but most people would say, as long as that image is still on there, it's good, it's still valuable. Okay, okay, well, you, then you, you, you say, okay, well, then, you know, you take it and you rub it in the mud and the dirt and everything, you get all dirty and everything, you still want it? Let's see, is that image still on there? Yeah, what is it, uh, Thomas Jefferson? As long as he's on there, baby. As long as the image is there, the father thinks it's valuable, you know. And, and so, you know, you take it and rub it under your arm, you stink now and all this kind of stuff. Do you still want it? And some people might not, but, you know, <laughs> some people have need. And they would go, I don't care, baby. You know, as long as it's got that image, it's valuable. Folks, the image of Christ is what's important. And yes, you fail. You get dirt on that image. But the image is still good. Still valuable to the Father. Yes, you do fail. But the image of the Lord is still there. I can see him in you. I can see Jesus. I see him. I'm not lying to you. I see Jesus in you. And I know that it's worth everything. You know, we, we've had so many young students pass through this Bible school. And you, you know, failure and failure and failure. My God, if they could only see what I see. The image of Christ is on them. They are so worth something. They are after the Lord. They're being imprinted and stamped. So that they'll be recognized by that imprintation, that image, which is Christ. But then they fail and they go, they get down on themselves. They get down. I say get up. Get up and realize that God is continuing a work in you. And he's bringing forth his son and he sees your son. And he's so pleased with the image of Christ. He's so pleased with Jesus, and all your dirt on it doesn't change him. That's right. <laughs> well, some people say, oh, well, then you get, you're making a license for sin. You know, yeah, I'm making a license for dirty money. It's going to get dirty. It's going to, you know. But it's still worth something, and that's just a dumb little picture of a real truth when Jesus said, hey, you render to Caesar the things of Caesar and give me my image. Amen. You know, you be sure and give me my, oh, that's fine with your money there, but you be sure and give me my image on you. You're what's valuable to me. <laughs> Praise God. And so I'm just telling you, and that's why I'm saying at the end of this, let's, let's, let's give something to God. Let's, let's make a step. Let's choose something. Let's us, instead of him moving on us to cause something, let's just turn around to him and say, oh, hey, you know what? No more of this right here. I'm with you. No more dragging my feet or no more sort of Jesus, you know? I mean, I want Jesus. And I, I don't, you do what's in your heart, but I'm just saying, I just... You know, he's always self-giving. But we have that image in us. Let's give back. Something. Anything. Let's give back and let's pour it into the, to the Lord. So the Lord put Noah into this ark and then he shut the door. 
Now, we always thought, oh, praise God. You know, can you imagine getting in the ark and then he shuts the door and goes, oh, praise God. Rain ain't going to touch me. Ain't going to rain no more, no more. You know, it's, I, I, he just shut me in this ark and everything is going to be good. You don't even know. He shut you in there <laughs> with all those beasts. <laughs> You know, but we're, we're so, you know, romantic in our view and everything. We go, oh, this is really good. Until, you know, about a week later we go, hey, hey, what? I can't get out. I'm in here until he lets me out. You know, I mean, that's a shocker. You know, you, you, you were ha- glad that he shut it on this side, but he, only God can open the door on this side uh, into the new creation. You know, amen. And so, look in, look with me. And uh, well, before we do, let me just comment on this scripture that we read here. It says, "The flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark." So here, and, and what well, goes on to say, "And it was lifted up above the earth." So you got death happening at the same moment that resurrection is happening. Amen. So you got three things happening. You got everything is dead. You got right in the middle of that resurrection, right? And right in the middle of that beast all around you. Right? It's all three there. And and so your mind, I mean, this is the conundrum of the whole thing. This is the enigma of the whole thing is that, you know, wait a minute. I'm dead. Wait a minute. I'm alive. Wait a minute, these things are in my face. That's where you can get confused. If you don't really understand the progress of the Lord and what he's doing, it is absolutely true. You are dead with Christ. What does it say in Colossians 3? 3, 3, I think it is. For ye are dead. You know, I'll never forget the time the Holy Spirit spoke to me and I was pretty young in the Lord. I was just learning about Christ and Him crucified. And, and I, you know, very naive. And you always worried about yourself. And I would sort of said to the Holy Spirit, so, you know, what does the Lord think about me? And that scripture from Colossians came, <laughs> for ye are dead. And it just hit me that that's really how He sees me. For you're dead. Wow. You know, what about all this stuff I'm trying to do to impress him with? He don't see it. And that's why he wants you buried so he doesn't have to have any stench from it. You know. But you're also risen in him, are you not? At the same moment, you are risen with him. But also, as long as you're in this ark and not the new creation, you're responsible for those beasts. You're responsible for getting to the place that you fully comprehend, not the ark, but the new creation where you're no longer responsible for the beasts and they disappear as far as your life is concerned. Amen? Except the clean ones. And all of those are offered up to God. (laughs) They represent Christ and Him crucified. Look in uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are we getting anything out of this? 2 Corinthians 4. um, Verse 16. For which cause we faint not, but Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. First of all, notice that there's two things going on at the same time. Something's dying and something's being renewed. At the same moment. John put it this way, he must increase and I must decrease. Now, I've heard people quote that and they go, oh, he must increase. Folks, it also says you must decrease. You know, we sort of forget that part. We, oh, I really want an increase of Christ. It's only going to come at a decrease of you. Now, 
Let me just ask you a question without you answering out loud. How many of you truly want an increase of Christ? Okay. Then, what is it going to take? I mean, in the reality, if your cup is full of you, are you willing? And, and you don't have to be willing, especially because I'm saying it here. The, the good thing is, I'm nobody. I'm just talking. So you can walk out of here and go, well, no, I really wasn't willing, and I fooled him. No, no, it's okay. If you're not willing, that's fine. But I'm asking you, are you willing? Do you really want, how about this, do you really want an increase of Christ? Do you really? Because you know, you know this, we can go on for years religiously saying, oh, I want an increase of Christ, oh, I want an increase, and never make any steps to decrease. Can I, can I get an amen? amen? We can just, you know... It can, uh, I want an increase of Christ, and he's going he's gonna to have to decrease me. Okay. Well, he's, he can do that. He can do that. Now, I was reminded recently, and Deb may remember this, but way back when with, uh, with uh, J.W., when he first started coming to Berean, and, and uh, uh, he went to the conference that we had there in, in uh, <clears throat> Dallas, and began to see Jesus and went back home and God was dealing with him about you know being a part of that and everything else but it was far away and he was raised in the panhandle and his father was a Texas Ranger and he loved his father and his father was getting old and it was just like you'd have to know J.W. and his father but his dad was a you know an incredible man but you know starting to get older and everything and so the Lord was dealing with J.W. about coming and he said, you know, no, no, no. And finally, you know, he said to the Lord, I can't, I can't forsake all. I can't go after you in this way. I've got to take care of my dad. And the Lord said to him, oh, is that the only problem that's in the way? He said, I can, I can take care of that. And J.W. knew what he meant. Went, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. This, you know, this is a factual story. If you ever get a chance to talk to him, I mean, this was, you know, I can, I can take care of that. If that's what's, if that's going to block you from me, if that's all it is, that's no big deal. We can deal with that. And J.W. said, you don't need to do anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's okay. Don't need to do anything. I'm with you. I'm fully all out with you. I want you. You know that I do. But, you know, I mean, sometimes we have to be confronted with things. We have to make steps, people. We have, you know, he said, you know, uh, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. Does it not say that? Draw near to me and I'll, it, he didn't just say, well, just walk around stupid and I'll knock you in the head someday. <laughs> Sorry, just the mention of J.W. made me say it like that. <laughs> oh no, don't let him hear this. He might get upset with me. <laughs> Be sure and send him this tape. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I'm telling you, I, I, all I'm saying is <clears throat> that, that there are obstacles that don't have to be obstacles. We do love Jesus. We do want an increase of Christ. But as long as we're, we're allowed to float, we will float. Amen. It's just tr it's human nature, folks. That's, you know what? That's one reason why people come to conferences like this, because they want the Lord. And because they're willing to shake things up a little bit. Am I right or wrong? I mean, because they're, they're going, you know what? Jesus is important to me, doggone it. <laughs> what? You know? And so they what we call bust a move. <laughs> they bust a move. And sometimes you have to pay for that. Sometimes there's a cost, whether it's financial for coming down or for, you know, somebody getting mad at you or whatever. You're willing to pay that because you want the Lord. And when, it, you know, when all of this is gone, the only thing that's going to be, you know, what is it? One life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Well, folks, what that means is that the only thing that's really worth anything 
is anything that is in relationship with Jesus by life. So let's, let's, let's live by life and let's go after the life we want to live by. Let's draw near to God and he will draw near to us. That's what I'm saying. And let me just, well, since we're going to take a few minutes here, I'll, we'll just do it shortly. <clears throat> there is this thing when you first get in the ark where there's sort of a gloating that you're in the ark and everyone else is out there dying. I mean, there, there can be. There is this thought that I made it, I, I, came to the, I came to the truth of Christ and him crucified, and they didn't. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and uh, you know, we believe in all this for us, but, but anyone else that doesn't believe the way we do, well, if you don't believe the cross the well, I do, you know, then you're just condemned because you don't believe my particular doctrine of the cross. And I'm going to say this, and a lot of people don't like me when I say this, but a lot of people don't like me anyway, so. <laughs> I've met people who know nothing about what we call deeper life, and they've got an incredible relationship with the Lord. And they are just as sweet as they can be, and that's by the nature of Christ. And they might call it something else. You know, a terminology thing. But it's Christ, and Jesus is bigger than New Creation Fellowship and Acts Bible School. Oh my God, if this is it, forget it. <laughs> come, I mean, you know, let's just, come on. You know. And you think I'm talking about the little facilities. I'm looking at these people. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> if this is it, forget it. <clears throat> no. I mean, just that, you know, I mean, there is, the Lord is so much bigger than we are. That's why we wanted the brick walls knocked down and the tents to be expanded. Because we don't want to get comfortable. We want the Lord to keep going. And so, you know, one, one of the ways that we get comfortable is that we, we start thinking that, you know, we're the, one, we're the only ones who got this. You know, we're the eight souls in the ark and everybody else is, you know, the dead. Because they're outside the ark. You were once outside the ark. I was once outside the ark. And if you're going to go fishing, it's out of that pool that you have to draw people into this reality. You know, or you just sit around ministering to yourselves all the time. Oh, you know Jesus, I do too. Oh, you're so deep. Oh, you are too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We, you know, and we just, you know, impress one another constantly. We just, you know, but I, I want you to know, after a while, it's not so impressive. You just get tired of hearing the same old stuff all the time. Some of you are still new, where you don't know. It's just like any other doctrine or truth, whether it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit or, you know, anything that you've progressed in. You stop right there, you'll make a doctrine out of it, and it'll get just as boring as anything else. I'm telling you, you say, no, it couldn't possibly. Yes, it could possibly, and will, you know. That's why you got to keep the life, you got to keep the fire burning, you know. You got to keep stirred up in the Holy Ghost. Oh, don't talk about the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Am I in trouble here? <clears throat> All right, I'm going to give you one more scripture, and then we're going to stop, and I'll just give everyone an opportunity to, to just do business with God on your level and the way that you want to do it. It's in uh, Galatians chapter 6, <clears throat> and it's along the lines of what we're talking about here. <clears throat> it says, God, but God, for, this is verse 14, sorry, Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. We glory in the fact that we're in the ark and they're crucified. They're the dead. They're the, you know, and we're, but Paul and the way the Lord dealt with him was, you know, God doesn't want you to glory in their death. God doesn't want you to glory in what happened to Adam. 
He wants you to glory in your death. I glory that the world is dead to me, the flood, and I, in this ark, am dead to it. Did I just not read? I mean, is that not what he's saying? Did I make that up? But God forbid, God forbids this, by the way. (laughs) Just a thought. That I should glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't just go, yes, that blessed Calvary Hill with those two pieces of wood. Or, yes, that doctrine that the old man is dead, you know. He said, you glory in that. Yes, I glory in it's crucified unto me. But guess what? There's another step. I'm crucified and I know it. And I've come to the reality by having to deal with this stuff in the ark. There's come, brought me to a place of reality <clears throat> that if I, if I don't embrace this, if I just hold the doctrine of the death of the old man and I was included in that, and never get to the place where I'm reckoning these things dead based on that, yes, based on that, but in a personal way, then you can, you can call it heresy, <clears throat> right? Because error is being off, but heresy is a half-truth. Am I right or wrong? Heresy is a half-truth. Well, half of the truth is the old man died, but guess what? The other half of the truth is that we died too. And that we glory not in their death. You know, well, you deserved it. You mocked me. But I deserve it. I mock God with my life. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But you're no self-righteous Pharisee is going to say that until he's been brought through the burial. So thank God for that. All right, well, it looks like we only got one more session on this Noah thing tonight. So it's going to be big, isn't it? I don't know. I'm not sure. <clears throat> if it hadn't been good up to here, I don't know that it's going to get good. Let's just, let's just do that. You can stay seated or you can kneel down and make an altar at your chair. Do business with God. Uh, just begin to... Uh, and if you'll play that thing, just, just in your own way, if there's some deal, just bow your head or whatever, and just take out a few moments to, to give back to the Lord and make some steps for the Lord. Only you know what that would be. Um, if, if Mike and a few others that would be willing to, just, just walk the room and pray in the Spirit and if, if the Lord tells you to lay hands on somebody, you, f- you feel free to do that. But let's sort of fill this room with the presence of the Lord. Deb, if you would do that too and just walk the room just a little bit as we pray. <coughs> <coughs>